This program was first broadcast on Canterbury's access media station, Plains FM, and was made with the assistance of New Zealand On Air. Welcome to Terra Nova Earth Talks. We speak with cutting edge experts and wise elders from across the globe on the issues and action our Earth is calling for. Brought to you by the Terra Nova Foundation, driving environmental change through human connection and collective action. Today on Terra Nova Earth Talks, we are talking change, the change that we can undertake for our Earth and how to work out the action that will get us there. Our world is in constant change and now more than ever. We are seeing fundamental shifts in our ecosystems and extreme climatic events are disrupting on a big scale. It can be easy to say we simply have to get better at dealing with these changes, mitigate so we can deal with them. But is it also possible for us to make change that will help bring back balance? The speeding up or change is not out of our control. In fact, it's speeding up largely because of our unchecked human behaviour. So, what can we do? Is the old adage, if everyone can just do something, that this will add up to big change? At Terra Nova, we help organisations identify the impact they want to see and how that is so crucial in their journey of change and the world around them. That it's not just a matter of identifying what we don't want, but actually rather what we do want to see that is really crucial. Today, though, we are very pleased to be talking with someone very used to dealing with incredibly dynamic contexts and change, who has had to make life and death decisions in these contexts, and who has incredible insight into how to achieve change when it matters most. We welcome to the studio renowned explorer and leading environmental scientist Tim Jarvis. Tim has climbed many of the world's most treacherous peaks, tracked through soaring heat and across the coldest places on Earth. He has led numerous expeditions to explore with purpose the wonders of this planet. And he has helped to join him through the documentary films and videos on social media. And he's given us incredible insight of his experiences as a top selling author. Tim, welcome and thank you very much for being here with Terra Nova Earth Talks. Great to be here. So let's kick off because I'm dying to get into questions today about change and to hear some of your really uh, amazing experience with uh, change as it's happening, but also uh, planning uh, for contexts that have a lot of change. So could you, um, and to give some insight into the extraordinary places that you've been in the world, could you tell us about some of your most uh, significant expeditions? Because I, for one, would love to hear about your expedition to the South Pole. Extraordinary, not something people do every day. So we'd love to hear the, the why, <laughs> why you went to, down to the South Pole and, you know, the, the whole expedition, what, what did it entail? Well, I always remember uh, the, the famous uh, mountaineer George Mallory, who climbed Everest and then sadly died on Everest um, in the 1920s, was asked, why do you climb it? And he said, because it is there. So that's, a, <laughs> that's an easy way of asking. And John F. Kennedy paraphrased that when he was justifying the space program in the 1960s in the US. And he said, you know, Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked, why did he climb it? He said, because it is there. And Kennedy said, and space is there and we're going to climb it. And I always love that. The way he yeah. did it. So there's an element of that. Um, look, I've been to the Antarctic many times, 13 times actually, and I've been five times to the high Arctic. Uh, they're not always expeditions. Sometimes I guide other people. Sometimes I take corporate leaders and try and get them to see what we're doing right, to the place. Wow, that's amazing. Um, yeah. And that's proven to be very effective at getting them to think about changing their behaviour. Mm. Um South Pole was a 2,700-kilometre trek pulling a 225-kilo sled that luckily comes down in weight as you consume the stuff in it. Uh, Gruelling but ultimately very uplifting. Um, and then I've turned the clock back and done expeditions the old way, including Sir Douglas Mawson, the Australian explorer's survival journey, and then latterly Ernest Shackleton and Frank Worsley's survival journey. 
So for those of you who haven't seen it, I do really encourage you to see the documentaries about this trip. I mean, it's just extraordinary. And uh, there's a book as well that uh, please do uh, dive in. But uh, tell us a little bit, because I don't think people appreciate the kind of, you know, the bottled up in the ocean that <laughs> took you to the Antarctic in the first place. I mean, it's an extraordinary achievement when it first happened. And you've just you know, made it uh, possible for us to really get the feel of what, why that was so amazing by doing it again. <laughs> well, you know, thank you for that. I mean, so Scott, the uh, English explorer, and Amundsen, the Norwegian, had already achieved the South Pole, which is kind of the middle of Antarctica, and, and Shackleton thought back in 1916, I will go one better and cross the whole thing, one side to the other via the pole in the middle and sail down in his ship, the Endurance, that Christchurch's... Frank Worsley was actually the uh, skipper of, and unfortunately the ship was crushed in the ice and sank. Mm. And then the expedition changed. It was all about saving themselves. And they arguably took part in a bigger journey of survival to save, you know, to save themselves than the original expedition crossing Antarctica would have, would have been. And it ultimately involved them in getting in one of the keelless 23-foot, 6.7-metre-long rowboats from the original ship and paddling and sailing this thing across the Southern Ocean from the Antarctic to a sub-Antarctic island called South Georgia to try and reach people to raise the alarm and save the remaining men left behind. And, and a rowboat is no exaggeration. Uh, and in fact, uh, we've, um, we're, we're going to welcome the boat, uh, the replica of the boat at some point uh, here in Christchurch too, which we're re really looking forward to. But the, yes, please, if you can give us a feel for, uh, it was a, a wooden boat. Uh, well, it's built like the original and the original was just a really a ship to shore rowboat. And uh, Shackleton at the time built up the gunnels, so the sides of the boat with a few extra planks just to stop the thing being swamped and built a deck using planks off the other two lifeboats. And he left those other two lifeboats and most of the men in Antarctica and got in this thing that they had kind of added to this, this, this third boat took the five strongest men and, and sailed from Antarctica to the sub-Antarctic to try and reach people and raise the alarm. That was basically basically it. Look, it's a cramped, unpleasant, <laughs> seasickness-inducing ride in a very dangerous, uh, unstable boat with no keel, which is yeah. the thing that stops you capsizing, uh, weighed down by a tonne of rocks to try and stop capsize in huge seas, wearing non-waterproof clothes, trying to navigate old style yeah. with sextants and things like that, no GPS. And it was extremely challenging, you know, really extremely challenging, team effort. Um, and you replicated the whole thing, right? Right down to the stitching on the sails almost. We did. I mean, we didn't sink the big ship and leave 20, 20, <laughs> 22 that, people in Antarctica. We, the rest we did. Good. The rest we did. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, bear in mind the clothing they wore uh, on that little boat journey was really totally inadequate. They they mm. had clothing that was windproof uh, and breathable mm. cotton designed for crossing the driest, windiest place in the world, which is what Antarctica is, not, not for this, the open, wet of this the open boat journey. So yeah. you're completely soaking wet mm. and cold. And it's <laughs> hard, it's hard. <laughs> So tell us a little bit because uh, I'm I'm really interested to know how you found the team dynamic during this. So this is extraordinary change happening to you, but you're also trying to do something within all this, you know, crazy context. How does that dynamic with the team, or do people act like a team? Because we're humans, right? We have this instinctive thing. We want to survive. You know, we want to build our bunker in our backyard just to make sure we survive. But actually, what what? How did it translate? Well, look, we've done a lot of the uh, look. I, I, look, I, I think I think achieving expeditions is around about really remaining focused on what you're trying to achieve and how you do it mm. changes all the time. So you need people who can think that way. They have a core technical skill, but they also are very adaptable. Mm. And they understand that the success of the whole thing is dependent on everybody kind of watching one another's backs and understanding how one another's roles work mm. so that you don't just diligently do your thing mm. when it's failing somewhere else and then that will cost the whole expedition. So you've got to sort of have people who think 
yeah, in right. that way. Yeah. That's extremely important. But in terms of by the time you get there in the small boat in the Southern Ocean, you've spent years together working out who one another is. Yeah, and right. you, you assess your risks and you have a very open conversation about that. And that helps everybody understand what they're getting themselves into. Mm. And that helps you build resilience in people when they know what they've signed up for. Yeah, sure. And I think we I think we often underplay honesty. Uh, people yeah. say, oh, I'm honest. And it's yeah. like, we're not really that honest most of the time. We, we, <laughs> we go so far. But in a situation like that, you have to be super honest. Right? Yeah, honesty in teams is also extremely important. I mean, I think you build a robust team when you have really frank, honest, open, sometimes combative kind of discussions about things up front. Mm. There's no point you know, you build good friendships and relationships with people when you realise those friendships are robust enough to withstand, you know, telling people honestly <laughs> what you think of something they're doing. Yeah. yeah. And so you have that with, with the they, team staff. And they take it well, isn't and it? Don't, yeah. Well, you know, hopefully, and you're, you're still friends. But And the honesty helps you build a really accurate assessment of the risk because mm. you've got to just table everything and be completely frank about your fear and... Mm. And that's the basis of everything, really. The strength of the team is that honesty and trust that then builds. No elephants in that room. Uh, no, 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 no room. No room on board. And I, I and I love the parallels to some of the climate and environmental conversations, right? Because I'm in a lot of meetings where people dance around, and the, and they'll say, you know, we really have to be honest about this. But then there's still elephants in the room that get danced around, uh, and I think that can be. Uh, really block actually the the goal that everyone's said because they're not actually really committed to the goal because there's not that real uh, yeah. strength of and it's bravery to be honest I think to yeah. really you know to not be so concerned about what someone else is going to say I think and, calling it like it is uh, when Shackleton's ship sank he gathered everyone round and told them the way it was and what their prospects were unless they all got together and followed a particular plan to get themselves out of it and I think yeah. just setting out the stall like that but still having a plan really gets people on board they think well this guy really understands the gravity of the situation but still feels we can make it if somebody underplays how serious things are you kind of lose respect maybe you think they don't grasp the reality of the situation mm. but equally if someone grasps the gravity of the situation and then is negative about the chances, mm. that's also not good. So you've mm. got to find that middle ground of saying, okay, look, things are not good. You know, you're substituting climate change whenever you want in this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then say, but look, if you do this, whether it's a country or a corporate or an individual, I do this, we do it honestly, we do it transparently, we can get ourselves through this. But if we mess around, mm. we're not going to make it. Yeah, and pretend, you know, I, I think... Um, uh, this, this honesty goes with trust, right? There's a very strong relationship between the two things, and uh, you don't build trust. And to get anywhere, you need trust because you need to rely on people to do their bit. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it was too true on that boat. You... Look, it's so it's so true, and it's certainly true in the environment space. I mean, the mm. thing that's sort of holding people back is that we all, I guess, know the aspirational goal of not warming the planet by more than a certain amount, one and a half degrees Celsius. Everyone's gone away and put together their plan that shows how they will be doing their bit to work towards that. Mm. But when you analyse it more closely, a lot of people are sitting on the fence waiting for the others to act first. Mm. And that comes down to trust. You know, are mm. we all prepared to do this? I think each one of us needs to act, you know, unilaterally and just go, you know, we're going to do this regardless of whether mm. anyone else does it because mm. we're being honest about this and we're doing our bit. If you choose not to, well... That's on you. Yeah, and um, and uh, there's a there's a certain type of um, let's say uh, there's well-being for sure, but there's something that really takes you to the core of who you are if you start to do that kind of uh, thinking. You know, I'm not going to wait for somebody else. I'm going to look inner <laughs> to my to my inner core and say, what is it that? Uh, why am I here? What am I? You know, I'm a human on this planet. Uh, I'm I'm not a robot. I uh, you know I think a lot of the time we we go to work. It's almost robotic the, the the way that we act. Actually, who are we and what's our contribution really going to be? If we can do those sort of honest internal conversations, helps hugely then to how we interact with others. Yeah, why are we doing this? I mean, I think a lot of corporate organisations sort of blindly pursue growth 
and again, countries are the same. Mm. Society as a whole keeps talking about growth and, and growth in what dimension? Mm. Do you want to grow as people? Do you want to grow as environmental stewards? Do you just want to fill our, fill our boots mm. while we can, mm. costing the next generation? And uh, the question is, you know, really what sort of legacy mm. piece is that? Yeah. We're uh, all going to die and what, what's the legacy <laughs> we've left, you know? Yeah. Um, you can't take it with you and so on and so on. So, look, I think um, I think we all have to have an honest conversation about what it is we want to be mm. remembered for as a legacy piece. And I certainly don't think it will be the acquisition of material wealth. No one really remembers that. Well, there's, it's what people say on the deathbed, you know. You, you, there's never been someone that's gone, I'm so proud of all the money I made. <laughs> Here's the bank balance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well done, on my you. headstone. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, it would. What would be great is if we, we could all collectively not wait till the gravestone. You know, actually do it now. Have the living legacy, as opposed to the after we're gone one. Yeah, that's why I think you know you only have to look at some of the world's most wealthy people to see that they are now turning to mm. philanthropy as the measure of their success. Sure, they've acquired a lot of material wealth to be in a position to then be able to give it away. And there's ego behind that too, don't get me wrong. But I'm seeing a growth in that. I think it's a good thing. Yeah, it, uh, you know, every day is a new day. You know, every day we, we wake up with the dawn. It's an opportunity to do something. So I, I feel like the every time someone wakes up and decides they're going to do something is a good thing. Uh, so if we can really encourage that. And uh, I too have seen the... Um, increase in philanthropy and, uh, to environmental causes particularly, uh, which is wonderful. It has been uh, the lowest area quite consistently around the world for giving to, um, and that's starting to change, which is great. Uh, one of the things we uh, talk about is the, um, the impact of uh, envir environmental uh, issues on all social things. So a lot of things are going to get worse if the environment is not actually uh, addressed. So we've really been encouraging people to start actually looking at not just uh, giving over there, but giving to the environments that they're living in. And that's then going to help everybody uh, as a result. Um, I'm going to just uh, 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 take a, a, a step back to the, the word change. People throw it around a lot. It's used with climate change, environmental change, but actually um, change doesn't just, uh, positive change when we've already got change happening to us doesn't just happen by accident. There's something that uh, has to be activated in order for it to occur. So it's, if we just hope, <laughs> do something and hope that the collective will just arrive, that's not really how it works. Can you give some examples of how you've uh, found that? Uh, and I, I guess it's partly the uh, having the goal, but I know that you've, you know, some of these expeditions you have planned uh, and made really conscious decisions the whole way through and, and looked at risks and uh, a whole bigger picture than... Yeah, look, I mean, change is a big, big topic. I think it's, you know, <clears throat> begins with a conversation around what it is you want to be known for, whether you're a company or an individual. What is it? What is the... The bigger picture piece here what is it you're trying to achieve with your life or with your business and understand what that is and really drill down to find out what it is mm. that that is then you've got to get sign off from everybody that are on the journey to try and do this thing mm. and this requires understanding that different people are maybe motivated by slightly different things so to mm. achieve that broader what you have to understand how might be a conversation that's different with each individual. You've got to get mm. them on board for that journey. You've got to deal with naysayers. You have to demonstrate tangible progress over time mm. to show you're moving towards it. You've got to be able to sort of measure that mm. and reassure your stakeholders and yourself that you really are moving things forward. You've got to appropriately resource that change. So it's all very well a corporate organisation saying we want to be greener, but what does that look like? Are you prepared to resource it? And how do you bring everyone along on the journey by mm. being emotionally intelligent enough to approach each person differently and package it up in a way that they feel comfortable with so you've got their mm. buy-in? Yeah, and I think sometimes businesses are treated like uh, entities over there. They're, they're not human, but actually a business is just a collective of humans, all 
come together for to make a product or a product and service or whatever it is, right? So you're going to have uh, lots of human behaviours in your organisation. Uh, for sure, I think it's the number one lesson of Shackleton. Really, is is uh, you know his crisis leadership is about emotional intelligence, about understanding. Mm. He had a team of twenty seven plus himself. Everyone in that team was different, if you mm. will, than pulling together. You've got to package things up differently. And uh, I found that every day when I talk to corporate organisations or individuals or politicians or kids or whoever it might be, that you know they've all got their own reason for wanting to do something. You've got to appeal to that, mm. show them evidence in using metrics that speak to that. Yeah, we love tangible. Uh, yeah, we love tangible. <laughs> we love tangible yeah. things. And yeah. uh, it's the problem with climate change. It's so it's so intangible. You can't see parts per million of CO2. And so the issue has been very difficult to, for people to get their heads around. So mm. you've got to find something that speaks to someone locally that, mm. that makes sense for them. Um, and then you'll have success if you can kind of keep everybody, mm. keep everybody on that, on that journey with you. Well, one of the things that, um, and it f can feel sometimes like change is happening very quickly, and people keep using these words, you know, urgent and quickly, and all of those things. But actually, um, we're not looking for quick, superficial wins on this front. Uh, so how do you kind of, um, uh, and I think. Uh, uh, me definitely included is uh, there's a bit of candy culture you know you want the sugar hit to uh, get the very quick uh, high of we we've done it uh, we've done something amazing but actually it's not this is not uh, helpful to the way that we can it's not good for us obviously but uh, for change for for it to happen uh, in terms of the environment we need uh, more substance how would you describe look i think it? Uh, i think when you break big challenges down into small pieces that applies in an expedition you know mm. if it's tough you don't think about the whole thing you think about the next hour or whatever it might be mm. we need to do the same thing in this space so uh, in australia for example where i'm based the CEO lasts just over three years in a stock exchange listed company. You've got to give him or her, as CEO, mm. what they can deliver within their time frame mm. that excites them, not just say you can be part of a 20-year vision piece. Mm. You've got to give them something that gives them that sugar hit within their three years and doesn't just make their successor yeah. necessarily look good. I wish people wanted to do it for those reasons, but sometimes you have to give them the shorter-term thing. And it's the same with politicians. There's no point giving them something that's going to be delivered after their tenure is finished, mm. you've got to give them something now. Mm. So it's up to us to break the total challenge down into small pieces and give people their sugar hit if that's what they need yeah. and get excited about delivering part of the solution to this long-term yeah, right. piece. If yeah. we can do that, we've got to be imaginative about how we, how we do that. And may, yeah, and maybe take the piece of fruit instead of the candy stick. <laughs> to follow yeah. that through, right? I, I <laughs> Try and seeing... choose a really good way to do it. Yeah, look, I, a... I, I, you know, I would, I would prefer it if people didn't need to be motivated in that way, but yeah. I think we all kind of have a bit of that in us. I, I think there's two worrying trends. I, I think, you know, environmental issues we're faced with now require longer-term consistency of approach. Mm. Um, but politicians, corporates, people on the street, children, we're all being judged on social media cycles, which are just instantaneous, mm. short... If you don't give the sugar hit quickly, yeah. people lose interest. You know, it's scrolling through YouTube clips with six seconds or whatever being the average time. You know, we are we are moving to faster and faster instant gratification based mm. society at a time where we need to be thinking longer term. So if the longer term issues require longer term thinking, but we have the short termism being mm. baked into society, we need to just break up the big picture stuff into those small bite sized things and yeah, and go back into who we are, because uh, we certainly aren't the 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 spinning uh, TikTok wheel. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, when I when I deliver uh, you know education stuff to kids at my reforestation project, mm. we finish by saying, look, there's two types of satisfaction you get from life. There's um, hedonia, which is hedonism. <laughs> it's you know, it's yeah. the sugar hit, the good song on the radio, you know. Yeah a beer in the pub with friends or something <laughs> like that. We all need that. That's great. But there's eudaimonia, which is the longer-term satisfaction you get out of being involved in something that requires a bit of effort, but you get a great sense of achievement in mm. return from it. And actually, we 
we need that just as much as the instant sugar hit. So don't be fooled. So I think if we continue down this path of just silly kind of instant sugar hit type stuff, we're going to find that we it's just never enough. Mm. You know, you need to take a step back and... That's wonderful. That, yeah. uh, that's a wonderful place to uh, finish, I think, uh, that really, you know, doing something that's of substance to you that makes you feel good uh, and, uh, and contribute. Uh, wonderful. Uh, a very big thank you for you uh, being here today um, and sharing your experiences. Um, incredible insight into... Um, your expertise and wisdom, uh, the experiences you had are just extraordinary, so thank you for that. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about Tim, uh, his travels and his findings, uh, there's some really wonderful data. If you're a data fiend, then, uh, you know, really start to dive into some of the work that he's done over the years. Uh, go to www.timjarvis.org um, or check him out on social media. Instagram, he's Tim Jarvis AM. Uh, you can find him there. Uh, but yes, big thank you to for being in the studio. It's just been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Terra Nova Earth Talks. For more information on the content and links from this podcast, go to the Terra Nova website. That's terranova.foundation. To listen to other interviews in this series, go to the Plains FM website. That's plainsfm.org.nz. Search for Terra Nova Earth Talks. Also on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Bye for now. <laughs>